Good afternoon, everybody. My name is Jeremy Demick. I'm an advocate here at Disability Rights New York. I want to welcome everybody to our employment roundtable, Exploring Careers in Disability Advocacy. We have six incredible speakers with us here today. Um, this should be a real treat. I'm um, excited to, to be here and to make this happen. Um, for a physical description for our viewers, I am a white male with blonde hair and blue eyes. I'm wearing glasses today, and I have a blurred background and a gray button-down shirt. ASL and closed captioning will be provided throughout the event. At the end of the event, we might have time for a Q&A session. Feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, if we don't get to the questions today, we will try and follow up with those after the event. And it's this will be an organic conversation with everybody. Um, so I I don't know where the questions you know will go, but um, we may have. I just anticipating a good conversation with everybody today. It's what I'd like to do is. Um, call on one of our call our, um, six speakers and just say your name and then also say where you work, what your position is, give a physical description for our viewers, and then just your preferred pronouns. Um, I forgot my preferred pronouns are he, him, and his. So we'll start this off. Um, I'm going to pass this to, to Leah first I knew you would do that <laughs> <laughs> don't hate me <laughs> it's all out of like res total respect hi everyone uh, my name is Talia Santiago Bonds uh, my preferred pronouns are she her agent um, I work at the office of mental health as the deputy director for the office of diversity and inclusion I am currently wearing a black blouse my hair is black I have black glasses and gold hoop earrings Thank you so much for having me. All right. Thanks, Talia. Um, I'll go in next to Kutia. Thank you, Jeremy. Can you hear me all right? Yeah, we could hear you really well. Great. Um, I'm so excited to be here. Um, so my name is Kutsia Naki. I use she, her pronouns, and I am a South Asian woman with medium brown skin, uh, shoulder length, curly, dark hair. Today, I'm wearing a black turtleneck and I've got a just a white wall behind me. Um, and I serve as senior counsel in the Office for Access to Justice at the Department of Justice. All right, thanks, Kutia. Um, next, we'll go to Nadia. Hello, everybody. I'm Nadia Adame. I use she, her pronouns, ella also. I'm a light-skinned Hispanic woman with brown hair, like a bob, wavy. Um, I am wearing a green sleeveless top. I am a, real, um, a disabled person, and I am also wearing a green necklace with green, actually with green stones all around. I am the artistic director at Axis Dance Company in the Bay Area in California. And we are a company that has disabled, non-disabled, -disab and neurodiverse um, artists, performers, and admin team. And I'm very excited to be here. Thanks, Nadia. And we'll um, next we'll go to Jacqueline. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Jacqueline Hayes. I'm the Diversity and Inclusion Program Specialist for the Council on Developmental Disabilities, or CDD. And my physical description is I have dark brown hair. Um, I'm a white woman with dark glasses, and I'm wearing a white and black striped shirt and sitting in my office in Albany. Um, and my pronouns are she and her. Um, and it's just great to be here. Thanks so much. All right, thanks, Jacqueline. We'll go to Anna now. Hi, everyone, and Jeremy, thank you for having me here. Uh, my name is Anna Durez. I am a white woman uh, with long, dark hair, wearing glasses and a blue-green blouse. Um, I work for the uh, New York State Commission for the Blind as a regional coordinator, and my preferred pronouns are she, her, hers. 
All right. Um, so we'll we'll jump into the questions. We are still waiting for um, Kara Leibowitz to join us. Um, I she may be having technical issues and may jump in at a later point in the presentation. Um, so I'm going to start out and just ask a little bit about what you do. What a what might a typical day look like? So we'll start off with Nadia. Talia, now it's me. <laughs> I was hoping it was going to be you again, but here we go. <laughs> this is Nadia speaking again. Um, so I'm the artistic director at Access Dance Company. We're a company of integrated dance, disabled, non-disabled, and now new diverse um, performers. We have been around for about 37 years, although I have not been in this position for 37 years. I'm a bit younger than that. Um, and uh, yeah, we our main goal is to bring dance to everybody and make dance accessible for the entire society. We're a great supporter of our disabled community. Um, we do some training programs for people who want to be dancers and they don't have training or they cannot access the training that they need because they're disabled. And this is a long path that we have been going through for many, many years, including for myself. As a disabled artist, I was not allowed to go into a university program for dance because of my disability, not because of my abilities. So we're trying to break those barriers and what we're trying to give opportunity to as many people as possible and bring dance to schools, bring dance to universities and bring dance to the to the professional stage and the professional field of dance. We try to break as many barriers as possible. I'm sure like everybody else here. And um, and we love building community and help one another. So that's the brief version. What I do. I've seen some of the videos for the some of the performances. They're really incredible. There's like a, a lot of just like the physical strength I'm looking at from some of those performances. It just I'm amazed, like just how much work goes into that and how how cool that is. Thank you. Yeah, we work very hard. People are like, oh, wow, that looks easy. No, it's not. <laughs> yeah, the company is actually currently in Mexico. Um, we are part of the, we got invited by the U.S. Department of Cultural Affairs and the U.S. Embassy in Mexico. And we, are, we were performing at the uh, Cervantino Festival in Guanajuato. And today the company is teaching workshops in Mexico City um, at the Instituto de Bellas Artes and something else. I forgot the name now. Yeah. That's cool. That's um thank you. That's Kutia. Um what is uh I'm gonna pass the question over to you. What is a, a what might a typical day look like for you at the that's Department a, of Justice? That's a great question and I feel like um, Nadia has such a fun job. <laughs> um, so I just as background I um came into this work, I am trained as a lawyer, um, but I don't do the things that typical lawyers do, like going into a courtroom and defending a case. Um, so what I do is policy work. Um, so, and that policy work is related to access to justice. And what is access to justice? You may very well wonder. Um, access to justice has to do with when people have legal problems, like um, they are getting married or getting divorced or they want custody over their child or they're living in a house but the landlord isn't providing them with everything they need to live in that house and they have to go to court. Um, so every day millions and millions of people have legal problems if they're going to courts to federal agencies and other different types of places to try to solve those problems, whether it relates to their health or their housing or public benefits like SSI and things like that. So our office is really dedicated to making sure all of those processes, whether that's a courthouse or a federal administrative office are accessible to people so that they are able to, to, to manage whatever their legal problem is and able to do so effectively because 
in many cases, so in a criminal case, um, under the Constitution, people are guaranteed the right to have a lawyer to defend them in court. But in a civil case, so by civil, I mean things other than like a criminal case, so a housing or family or public benefit matter, there's no right to a lawyer. So most people have to navigate those systems by themselves, and they're often really, really complicated using lots of fancy legal jargon and Latin and things like that. And so our, our job is really to make sure that those processes are easy to follow for people, that they have the support that they need to get through that process. So um, my day-to-day -day can look really varied. It can be anything from reviewing a regulation and providing comments on it. It can be giving a training to groups of legal services providers. Um, it could be uh, doing right research and writing and helping to inform some of the policies or rules around how justice is delivered. So um, it's, a, it's a, I love the job because it, I do lots of different things every day and no day ever looks the same. Does your job bring you to different parts of the country doing this systemic work? Uh, sometimes it does, yeah, because I work at the U.S. Department of Justice, which is uh, covers the whole country and is a huge organization, does lots of different things, and um, our work does span all over. Um, I personally have traveled a little bit, um, but my colleagues are always all over the country speaking to lawyers and people in the community to understand what their needs and challenges are. So, yes, we definitely work all over the country. Definitely a lot of traveling for that systemic work. <laughs> Thank you. Um, I'll pass the question over to Anna. What might a typical day look like for you? Um, so I work for the New York State Commission for the Blind. And um, it, my background is a vocational rehabilitation counselor. Um, our services are, are geared to individuals who are blind and legally blind uh, to help them with ultimately employment, um, but also just to maintain their independence. So we do a lot of training um, in services related to uh, their daily living skills, their travel, the ability to travel. Um, but ultimately, as a vocational rehabilitation counselor, we want to work with individuals, um, help them set goals uh, for reaching employment and um, identifying the different areas to to get there. So it's it's not always a straight path to identify what they want to do and and get them there, but to provide training and education, um, and any other issues um, that may come up, such as um, social emotional issues, um, questions around benefits advisement, um, are all different areas of of what we do at the Commission for the Blind. And my understanding is that there's been a real focus on working with youth um, in the last couple of years, like that transition period between high school and college. So, yes, um, at our agency, we actually work with children uh, as young as three years old. Uh, we take cases uh, from birth, um, but three years old to um, start some some uh, mobility training, um, socialization, recreation, but also um, a lot of our focus, um, as Jeremy is saying, is with our um, adolescents, our, our high school um, age. So we provide uh, internships in the summer, work experiences, um, a lot of focus to um, have our, our youth um, identify the different careers that are out there um, to give them exposure to what their interests are. That's great. Thank you. That's and to Jacqueline, what what might a typical day look like where you work for you? Yeah, so I work at the Council on Developmental Disabilities in New York. We're a federally funded state agency. We are one of I think the smallest state agencies. So there's only twelve staff, um, which is very small for a state agency, and we carry out our mission primarily through grant projects. We are um, authorized under the DD um, Assistance and Bill of Rights Act. So there's a council like ours in every state and territory in the US. And um, you know, so some of the work that I do day to day is overseeing some of that grant work, which is really exciting. 
It's a lot of pilot projects, um, working with advocacy groups who might be doing an advocacy-based grant. Um, and then in my role as our diversity and inclusion program specialist, I also kind of oversee the implementation of our uh, diversity, equity, and inclusion and accessibility strategic plan. Um, and so, you know, some of the, the grants as well are with multicultural agencies um, and, and, you know, doing the work that they do on the ground. They're really the ones who carry out a lot of our mission. Um, and then I'm also our, because we're small, we often wear a lot of different hats. So I'm also our agency's language access coordinator. So sometimes it's also working with our language access vendors and, um, you know, doing some of the, the work there. And then I should mention also, which is so important to the work that we do is that we're directed by a council and our council acts kind of like a board of directors and under federal legislation, that must be 60% people with developmental disabilities and their families. So a voting majority um, and really working with our council members on work groups or getting input from them, or we have, you know, we're coordinating council meetings and that's also really good. So um, day to day things look pretty different, which I really like. I think there's a lot of room for um, having different days for problem solving, creative thinking. And I really like that about this job. And plus I really like the mission of what we do. It sounds like there's a lot of diversity in that, that you're, like you said, you're wearing a lot of hats in an agency that's 12, 12 people doing all that systemic work. It, it sounds like a, there's a lot there. There's a lot going on and that's across New York state. Yeah, so we're, our reach is statewide, um, but our office is located in Albany. And so um, I should, I know some um, people talked about travel to before COVID, I thought I did a lot more community outreach that basically, you know, there was like a year where New York state agency staff couldn't travel at all. And then we're kind of um, getting back into it. So I'm trying to kind of also do a little bit more community outreach just in New York state. It really is um, within the state. Great, thank you. That's Talia, I'm gonna pass the question over to you. What does a typical day look like? And I know that when we set up this event, um, you may have, your typical day may have changed because of something recently, like a yeah, significant. promotion. <laughs> so I was previously um, the statewide language access coordinator for the Office of Mental Health, and I was uh, probably a, a week or two weeks into my appointment as deputy director of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. So that's exciting, um, but it comes with a lot of work attached. So um, my days look very, very different um, right now. Um, and most of my work, well, I'll explain it like this. As the deputy director um, of the Office of Diversity and Inclusion, there are several bureaus underneath the Office of Diversity and Inclusion. One of the bureaus is the Bureau of Reasonable Accommodations. And so through that work, I have a unique opportunity to really serve our employees and ensure that they have everything that they need in order to perform their essential duties. Um, so that's work that I've been tasked through there. Um, it's a wonderful bureau. I mean, every single day, it's just different there. Um, no case is the same, um, but it really piggybacks and ties to my experience at DRNY. Full disclosure, I used to work at DRNY. Um, so this is home. So yes, I'm to be home Welcome again. Back. <laughs> <laughs> Hello to all my friends and former colleagues. Um, but that really laid a good groundwork for this role now that I'm currently in. Um, aside from that work, we also have programming. And so my office is tasked with the unique we have the unique opportunity. There's no obstacles, only opportunities, right? To help reduce disparities in access and quality and treatment outcomes for historically marginalized communities. And we do that a few ways. We do that by programming, right? We have 24 psychiatric centers in which we oversee all the equity activities in. Um, we also do that through education. And so we do tons of webinars and trainings throughout the entire state. Um, mm -hmm. We collaborate a lot with different agencies as well. It's really challenging to serve a whole person if there's no collaboration um, in addressing the social determinants that um, create the barriers. Um, so yeah, very different. Every no day is the same. Tons of emails, tons of meetings um, now more than ever. Um, but thank you for that question. And I hope that answered the question. Absolutely. Thank you. It's um, 
So I'm gonna we're gonna move to the second question, and this um, I'm gonna start off with Kutsia. It's you know what are some of the rewarding aspects of your work, and I know that everyone may have touched on this a little bit before in the past question, but let's dive a little deeper into that. Yeah, that's such a that's such a great question and an opportunity to reflect. I, I really I feel so fortunate to be in the role that I'm in, and um, some of the things that I find most rewarding. Well, well, first and foremost is that, and I I didn't mention this earlier, but my my personal sort of portfolio. So I sit on the policy team in our office, and I. Um, one aspect of my policy work is working on disability and access to justice. And that's something that is really important to me as a person who is disabled themselves. Uh, I didn't mention earlier, but I'm, I'm blind, which is part of the reason why I'm here. Um, it, it's, it's so exciting. So for a long time, my disability was sort of not really a part of my work um like it was it was something that was personal to me but i and i, I was doing work um, my expertise is in immigration and civil justice as i mentioned um but I, I i never really thought about how my disability relates to those other things that i was working on and in the last few years i feel like i've started to understand how important it is to build access into our justice system. So when a disabled person is going through the court process or trying to apply for a benefit or um, in immigration deportation proceedings, making sure that they are treated fairly and equitably in that process so that they have access to a sign language interpreter, there's information presented to them in a way that they can understand, they're able to communicate effectively. And, you know, I saw a lot of that, I've seen that in my work as a lawyer, just how hard it is to be a blind lawyer, a lot of things are inaccessible, if there's you know, paper coming at you in a courtroom and you can't read it or um, a building is not really navigable and there's no system for you to get around. And so I saw that those things in my in my practice as a lawyer and I, I realized this was a real systemic problem, both for lawyers who are disabled, but also for people who have to navigate these systems without lawyers who have disabilities. And so that is probably the most rewarding aspect of my job is to be able to bring those things together. So in other words, you know, I used to always think, oh, I don't want to work on disability. I don't want to be put in that box. And I'm sure many of you have thought that as well. Um, you should pursue whatever career you wish to pursue. But um, disability access is, is to me less about my identity and more about a discipline and a way of doing things. And I'm excited every day to be able to bring those concepts, the importance of creating access for people uh, so that they can be included in our, you know, our, our legal systems in our civic civic society, um, you know, being able to, to think about creative ways to build that discipline of disability access into everything that I do. That's great. Thank you. That's, um, and it's, I don't think that the courts always think about that in terms of how they're presenting information to people like here, you have a visual impairment or you're blind, read all these documents, the legal size and all the fine print too. Exactly. And I, I will um, pass, pass this question to Nadia. Um, just can you tell us about some of the rewarding aspects of your work? Yes, I couldn't find my button. This is Nadia speaking again. <laughs> That's okay. It's, that it's happens to me too. That we know we have to turn on and off, and then we can never find them, at least for me. But here I am. Um, well, I have a lot of rewarding moments in my work. I think the main thing for me is to open people's mind and perception and, of what disability in the arts is and could be. Um, I think also when you give opportunities to people that never had opportunities before, because of their disability. And all of a sudden they are in a space where they belong and they are accepted as they are. We're not trying to change anybody. We work with the people that we have in the studio and we work with the people that we have there. Um, I think when, 
when those participants and those dancers and those kids, when we work with kids and they feel like represented and they can see and experience somebody who is like them, that changes the perception and also the dreams. They change their dreams because now they feel, okay, if you do that, I can do it too. You know, we've been talking in society about this for a, for a few years now. And, but, and I think it's true. I think those are the moments that, you know, when a parent even comes to me and say, oh my gosh, thank you for being able to have my kid in your dance class. They never were able to do it before. That's, that's rewarding and that fills our hearts. Um, yeah, and when people come with ideas and think, oh wow, I never thought a disabled person could be a professional dancer and touring the world. And like, well, yeah, yeah. <laughs> at the highest level. So I think changing perceptions and changing opening minds is the biggest reward I get. And I always tell the company that, you know, we don't save lives like many of you and the other panelists do, because I think you literally save lives with what you do. But I do think that we at Access we change lives. And that's also important to acknowledge. That's great. That's, I think it's a, just empowering for anyone that's, you know, may have never thought they can really access this and have this experience as being able to express themselves through dance and, and surprising the parents as well. Like, they're like, hey, this, these opportunities are open. Yes, it's, it's wonderful. It's a great feeling at the end of the day. Tulia, I'm going to pass the, the question to you. Um, what are some of the rewarding aspects of the work that you do? Um, the most rewarding aspect of my job is that I get to bring my true authentic self. Um, I was hired primarily because of my lens, my experience, my life experience, which is amazing. It doesn't happen often. Um, and I feel extremely grateful um, for that. Um, you know, as someone, as a Latina, um, who grew up in an inner city, in an urban area, and experienced marginalization firsthand. Um, and now for me to have the unique opportunity to actually have a say in dismantling oppressive systems that um, previously oppressed me um, in some way, shape, or form, or my family members, um, it's just special. And so, like I said, you know, I'm extremely grateful for the opportunity. Um, the work is heavy. Um, but it's extremely rewarding. I feel like I understand the subject matter because I've experienced it. I've gone through it. And therefore, I'm able to kind of um, loan this um, unique kind of opinion to it. Um, I can sit at a table and feel like I belong there because I know what this road is like. Um, and I get to create policy to make change for these individuals who have historically been unserved um so it's all good stuff and um it you know i'm excited to be here and it's there's a what i think something cool about that is like shaping those systemic policies to and then and just being able to make that kind of change on that level Exactly. Impactful. And not to say that, you know, everyday advocacy isn't right. It's super important. But I mean, you know, I'm not a bureaucrat yet. Right. So it's it's so interesting that they want me at the table, the person who's least bureaucratic <laughs> as possible. So, um, yeah, you know, they're like, we want pull up a chair for Talia. We want her. Yeah, here they want the Latina from Baruch Drive. Like that's that's amazing. Um, And but that just goes to show how the the. um perception, the idea is shifting, right? You know, they're no longer looking at, you know, individuals or just, you know, degrees as being, um, as validating, right? Validating an individual, whether they deserve to be at a table. And I'm excited for that. Um, it speaks volumes that our governor is willing to um, kind of change that narrative. That's, thank you. That's, Jacqueline, I'm going to pass the question over to you. It's, can you tell us about some of the rewarding aspects of your work? 
Yeah, I think, you know, working with people and getting to collaborate with our council members and the public and other people in state government and other agencies, that's probably one of the things that I like the most, just getting to talk with a lot of, you know, diverse people across New York State. That's really awesome. Um, I think fixing problems too, I get, <laughs> I get like a serotonin bump if, you know, like someone's come to me with an issue or a problem and you know, our agency or working with other people, we were able to actually fix it or solve the problem or, you know, kind of address it. Um, and then, you know, I, I think kind of to that point, one of the things I, I realized early on, I've, I've been at our agency, this is my 10th year now. And at the beginning, I, I would get so frustrated because I just felt like things weren't moving quickly enough in state government. Like, why didn't this happen yesterday? Or, you know, and now I think I'm at a place a little bit where I know it's going to take a long time, but once it's there, it's there. Like when it's government, it's like if you change something in government, it's going to stick for a very long time and you can kind of like institutionalize things. So I think once you get it in there, it's there. <laughs> it's there. It's there, you know. Um, and and of course, like there's a lot of work that goes into it and like a lot around that. But I think there's a kind of power in that, too. Um, I think like Talia was saying, like the, the policy part too, I think if you can shift the policy, so it's not just like, you know, I fix this problem for this one person, but that like now pe all people won't face this problem. And that's really, that can be really powerful. It can take a really long time to do and figure out and, you know, get <laughs> past the finish line. But, you know, I think when that happens, that's a, that's a really big deal and um, a really exciting part of like government work. Thank you. That's um, so. Anna, we'll pass that question to you. Um, just what what are some of the rewarding aspects of your work? So um, we started uh, this this meeting today, which um, I found was rewarding. When uh, Jeremy, you had asked us to uh, physically describe us. So the aspect of um, advocacy and um, accessibility for everyone um, in in small moments like um, everyday items um, to trainings like this um, uh, open to to many individuals um, is always rewarding to see that we are um, impacting um, society that we um, are present um, and um, uh, I a part of 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 everyone that that we can access everyone else. Um, our another uh, part is just to see someone's um, success um, and success for for individuals with vision um, loss is is different for everyone. Um, so to see someone succeed um, in an employment goal is very rewarding, but to see someone. Um, succeed in their daily living skills or um, learning Braille and identifying that now they have an easier way to access um, everyday items that that make it easier for them to access um, are all different parts of um, of our role and makes the the role more rewarding. And it. It sounds like there's a real focus on this holistic, like the whole person, um, you know, like you said, like the everything from access to just things at home. And um, that's all part of the success, like the orientation and mobility skills and accessing like any assistive technology and stuff. Right. It, it's it's also just seeing individuals um, develop their own self-advocacy skills um to to be independent um to um have the strength to identify what their their needs are um and everyone is so individual so it it, it makes the the role even more more interesting and many times um i'm the one who's learning from the individuals that we are interacting with thank you it's i'm gonna ask um so I'm going to go to one of the next questions, and this is, um, are there opportunities to express your creativity and creative problem solving? And I'm going to start with Jacqueline. And just, could you also um, just give an example of the creative problem solving? 
Yeah, absolutely. So um, there is, I think sometimes, you know, I know um, Talia mentioned this too, sometimes like the state can be a bit bureaucratic. <laughs> and so it can be challenging to like get people to the space of creative thinking but I think it is possible in state government. And um, one of the work groups that I oversee is a cultural competency work group. And one of the issues that um, one of our members brought to us, she is a Chinese American immigrant. And she was talking about how challenging it was when she came to New York to navigate disability services and how she really wishes there was a bridge or she knew about them sooner, people connected her sooner, all this, um, you know, that's, there's much more to the story there, but so at the time we reached out to the office for new Americans and kind of talked with them, like, can we do a project together? Can we address this issue with, you know, new Americans with developmental disabilities, giving some more support and assistance to find disability resources in our state and really with working from their expertise, because they have a lot of experience working with new Americans with, just new Americans, and we had more experience with developmental disabilities. We kind of co-created a project called the Ramirez June Developmental Disabilities Navigator Initiative. And luckily, you know, we again carry out a lot of our mission through grant work. So we do have some funds that we can use to partner and pilot projects. So we piloted in coalition and collaboration with the Office for New Americans, the Ramirez June developmental disabilities navigator initiative and um we actually so the name came from um one of the families that they had known the ramirez family who had um a son with a, a developmental disability and then the other name june was the member of our cultural competency work group so we decided to name the initiative after them and you know it was influenced by their stories so there is definitely room to do it. I think, you know, it can take a little bit of time and you do have to kind of like convince people, like there's a lot of like almost sales pitching that has to go on um, to get people on board, but I think it is um, possible and, and great things can come from that. Do you feel like this is sales pitching between the agencies or is it sales pitching to the, within the bureaucracy of the state? I think a lot of times you're competing with other priorities. And so there's some of that. And then there's also, you know, I, I do think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to diversify the state workforce. And so sometimes you have people in positions who just don't understand because they don't have the lived experience. Why, like, you know, like, so it does take a little bit of convincing if it's something that's not as familiar to them. Um, so I think that, and then, yeah, sometimes if there's money involved, that always <laughs> can be a little bit of a, a challenge, but um, we'd be curious to see what others think too. All right, thank you. That's, I'll pass this question over to Talia. Just the yeah. creative problem well, solving. Creative problem time. So wait, shout out to Cynthia Stewart, right? Because we work with DOS and um, Cynthia Stewart from the Juno Ramirez Initiative pretty frequently. They're awesome. They're awesome, great, and a great resource. So if anyone needs any, you know, data, they're always on point providing us with statistics on new Americans and how we can better serve them. So I'll throw that out there. Um, yeah, I mean, creativity is the name of the game here, honestly, especially when you're attempting to serve someone as a whole, right? So this integrated care concept is... Um, it's not a concept. It needs to happen. Um, but for some, they're you know they're still piloting it, right? And it still seems like this forest, foreign concept. And to kind of speak to what Jacqueline just said, it's like it does take a lot of sales pitching, um, lots of meetings, um, <laughs> lots and lots, lots of meetings to um, make something happen. Um, I don't know. We tried to implement this like really small. It was you know small policy two years ago um, when I first got here, and we just got approval. <laughs> two weeks ago so it's interesting things do take a long time but they last forever right so um whenever they're implemented um for me in my line of work um the best example that i can give regarding creativity is that we similar to what jacqueline said there's not enough diversity in the top right um and that's something 
that influences a lot, right? Because if there's no diversity on the top, that means there's only one lens really being loaned to policy creation, which is a huge problem across all state agencies. Um, and one of the issues we were having in wanting to provide culturally competent care is that we didn't have enough multilingual providers um, that worked for us. And how do we do that with without um, kind of disrupt also while also honoring the civil service system? So one of the things that my group uh, created was a SUNY CUNY pipeline program. And so what we're starting to do is we created this pipeline program where we provide SUNY and CUNY students who are interested in the men pursuing a mental health career, whether it's, you know, psychology, sociology, social work. Um, we gave them grant funding um, and said, you come work, you graduate. The, the criteria, first of all, is you have to be from a historically this population. You also have to know another language. We didn't assess any fluency. Nonetheless, by doing that and creating this pipeline funding, it's almost like we're planning for the future, right? We know mm -hmm. that once these individuals graduate, they're more than likely to come work for OMH, crossing fingers. It's, it's not a requirement. All but right, that's what I we're hoping. Crossing my fingers too. Like <laughs> that's what we're hoping you... for. Um, and so you know, that's the best way that you know during those the transition youth age is the real age that people start deciding what they want to do with their future. Um, kids really want to, especially if you come from a marginalized population. I know when I was looking at what I wanted to be when I grow up, I'm still not done growing up, right? Um, I was thinking how much money I can make from whatever degree I obtain. Um, so that was really what drove me because I knew that my parents didn't have money. Um, so if we can start creating these pipeline programs for college students really early and planting the seed, um, more than likely they'll be able, they'll want to go into state service or, you know, come work for this agency. So that's one of the creative things that we implemented here. Um, I have stories for days, but that's the most recent um, successful <laughs> um, program that we've implemented. That is really awesome. Thank you for sharing that. That's. I'll pass the same question over to creative for creative problem solving to Kutia. Thanks, Jeremy. I'm so I'm so resonating with what both Talia and um, Jacqueline have shared as someone who is in a similar government bureaucracy. Um, I think another another aspect of creativity in that environment where you're trying to make systemic change that will benefit a group of people as opposed to just one individual at a time. Another thing that you have to think about is how to break down silos. Often in government, people work in their little corner and um, that's what they know. And you know, one example of uh, something our office did that was sort of a creative strategy to break down a silo was that um, our office houses the language access coordinator for the Department of Justice. Um, and, uh, you know, she really um, is, is, it has a lot of vision and um, really cares about um, including um, people with communication disabilities. And specifically, um, aside from that, um, making sure that people who are deaf and hard of hearing are also included when we think about language access. So typically sign languages, for instance, are never included in um, how we define language for language access purposes. Um, and also there's you know, a huge gap for people who both are deaf or hard of hearing and who are, have limited English proficiency. And so um, in August, uh, the Department of Justice released its uh, modernized and revised language access plan. And that language access plan for the very first time in the history of the department includes uh, deaf and hard of hearing communities among its per, it, it, within its purview, um, and it acknowledges sign languages as languages, which was just a huge deal. And it took a lot of um, sort of bringing people together inside of the department to understand that um, people are not don't live single issue lives, and they um, you could have limited English proficiency and also um, be deaf or hard of hearing and need access to sign language in not just ASL but other types of sign languages. Um, and so that that really took a lot of creative problem solving and most importantly, just kind of bringing people together and helping them see how their work relates to each other. Thank you. And it, like you said, like breaking down those silos to make all that happen and just like all that coming together. I definitely want to check that out. 
I'm happy to share a link as a follow up to this call if that would be of interest to folks. Yeah, thank you. That's, and I'll pass the question over to Nadia. Just some examples, an example of creative problem solving in the work that you do. Um, this is Nadia speaking again. Well, creative is what we do every day, all the time. It's a hundred percent. That's it, yeah. It's yeah. So I don't, I don't have like very specific examples because I think it's so ingrained in us to be creative every single day about everything we do that um i don't have anything that it comes to mind that is so specific about that but i if i may i'm going to ask a question to some of the panelists especially those that are working with law and governments because i echo what anna was saying earlier about we work with the individual as an individual and not one person represents their entire community. And I think in society, sometimes people think, oh, because you're disabled, um, because you Nadia are disabled, you represent the entire disability community, which is not true. I represent myself. And yes, there might be some commonality with other people that might use a wheelchair or crutches, but we are not all the same, same, you know, if you're a Latina or Latino or, or Latinx, you don't represent the entire community, you represent yourself. So within the law that it's always, in my opinion, sometimes very rigid, <laughs> how do you work that individuality of the, of the person and be able not only to give access to a general community, but also to that specific individual. I'm very curious because this, this came up in my head when Anna started um, mentioning it. And yeah, within the bigger law, you know, and bureaucracy, like you were saying, I wonder how that is navigated for all of you. I threw a question, sorry, Jeremy. <laughs> No, <laughs> no, this is, head, and I really want to hear from the, the specialists. I this is creativity right here, so I, let's go with it. Let's. There you this go. is an organic <laughs> conversation and a very it's a safe space for all of this. Yeah, I guess I can unmute. I'll unmute and um, speak to that a little bit. Um, ever as it pertains to policy, uh, you're absolutely right. And I made that very clear when I took on this appointment, right? I represent, you know, it's my experience. I can't loan opinions on what every other um, Latina um, faces, right? Um, but in a lot of this decision-making, there's panels, right? So we have a table full of diversity. And in this office, um, you know, I've made a huge point to encourage um, diversity hiring, diversity of age, ethnicity, um, um, ability. Um, and so when you bring all those different opinions to the table, um, they don't let me miss a beat. <laughs> That's what I'll say. Um, and they hold me accountable, right, for the things that I may not be seeing. And that's super important um, because sometimes there's policies that we may put in place that is well-intended, but when we put them out into the community, right, and our stakeholders see it, they're just like, this is trash. <laughs> so it's really important to me that I make sure that, you know, I have diverse opinions at the table um, before we push out any policy. So that's specific to policy recommendations. When we're talking about integrated care, that, that's really complex. One of the things that we're trying to move towards is um, at intake, ensuring that we address all the social determinants um, that may be affect, you know, all the barriers that a patient may have. And so it's it's interagency collaboration. There's plenty of times where we know someone, we meet with someone and they say, oh, I, I, I have, a, like, I can't access, um, you know, services. Um, so, I, because I don't have no transportation, for instance. And what are we doing? We're calling MTA and trying to figure out a way that we can get a free Metro card. Um, but what what's vital in that is that that collaboration across agencies and maybe you're networking and really have, um, lifelines, people that you can call for a favor. Um, so I find myself constantly like, I need a favor. And I, you know, and we try to return that. So I think that that's um, crucial, right? When you're trying to provide integrated care, making sure that you have the connections and the resources and you can connect patients. Um, it's not easy. 
we fail miserably at it regularly. Um, but the more importantly, we're trying really, really hard to make sure that we address those um, disparities. Um, and right, and once we remove those barriers, it's so much easy for, easier for a, a person to kind of be open, right, to mental wellness. But as long as they have all those other preoccupations and all those other worries and there, there's disparities and just things they, they lack access to, it's impossible for them to focus on their own wellness because they're in survival mode. Um, so, you know, I encourage all agencies, all organizations to make sure that they really consider that um, when they're providing services. And that's... Um... Talia and Nadia, thank you. That's um, so we're we're down to the last couple minutes. I just want to. This is an open question for everyone in our panel. Just what advice would you give students or people in our audience that might be looking into exploring a career that intersects with um, disability advocacy? This is Nadia speaking. I will say go for it. Definitely do it, um, go for it. We need to, man, we need not only disabled people working like Talia was saying um, and being at the table and giving opinions and giving their experiences, but also we need um, allies that support all of that. So I would say, if you're interested, if you wanna work with people, if you wanna make this world a better place, go for it. Don't think about it twice. It's going to be hard and it's going to be beautiful all at the same time. That's it. <laughs> I agree with Nadia. Uh, go for it. Um, find a mentor in, in the field that you, you'd like to pursue. Um, get an internship. Um, do informational interviews. Um, I'm certainly willing for anyone to, to give me a call. Um, and we can talk about the field and profession, but um, I say follow your 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 dreams, your passions, and um, and go for it. I would just echo that too. I think you know, don't place limits on yourself or box yourself into one track or one field, especially early on. I think a lot of, you know, I hear a lot of young people talking about like, I'm gonna do this, and this is my 10 year, five year plan. And I think just, you know, giving yourself freedom to really explore a lot of different options and really try stuff out and um, see what you enjoy, you know, see what you really like doing and don't put those kind of limits on yourself. This is Katia. I would go back to something that I said earlier. Um, spend time to learn about disability culture, disability history, um, like everyone else has been saying, find a mentor um, who is also disabled um, that you can look up to um, because you can take that know-how and that understanding of disability culture, why access is important, um, all of those things with you into whatever it is that you do. And you can be a disability advocate in any space um, that you wish. Like I said, I work in the access to justice field and surprisingly, um, oftentimes disability is left out of that conversation um, when we talk about access to legal systems. And that is something that I have come to decide I, would, I wanted to champion. I wanted to be the bridge to create that sort of cross movement, cross advocacy solidarity. So even if you don't go into a, dis, a, a job that's directly related to disability rights or disability advocacy, advocacy per se, know that that um, disability advocacy can go with you in whatever that you do. That's, thank you. That's for all of that advice for our, our students and people in our audience today. Um, if we're down to the last minute or two, um, if anyone wants to post in the chat, if they have a, a question, we might be able to take one question before we um, wrap up today. So I, I don't see anything in the chat yet. Um, 
But I, I do want to ask one follow up. If um, Anna, you mentioned like the the inner like possibly doing like the internships and reaching out to you. Um, is that something that could we for any of the, the our guest speakers today that feel comfortable with that? Like if they want to advise, like connect people with suggestions for a pathway, um, like the program that Talia, like you mentioned for CUNY SUNY. Can we share that with our um, with our audience today? Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. So I want to um, I'd like to thank everybody today, all of our panelists with us here today, our sign language interpreter Carrie, um, and our CART as well closed caption interpreter Christine. I want to wish everyone a great afternoon and thank you so much for being here with us today. Thank you. Thanks so much. This was excellent. Thank you so much. This is wonderful. All right. Thank you, thank you everybody. Me. Bye. Bye. Bye.